Okay, so welcome to the 28th video in the discrete structures series and this video is going to resume the discussion of proof methods from our last video. We'll be looking into proof by contradiction. So we'll first look into the idea behind the proof by contradiction and follow that up with a couple of problems. Following that we'll be looking at a couple of other proof methods, proof by adjustion and then we'll look into a proof by cases and we'll also be solving one problem each for these two categories. And to end this video and the chapter, we'll be looking at a small theoretical topic called mistakes in proof. So we'll first look into this theoretically and then we'll look into an invalid proof example and try to find the mistake in that proof. Alright, let's get started with the discussion of contradictions. So let us try to understand the concept behind the proof of contradiction with an example and then we'll try to formalize it later. Let us look at this example. I want to prove a proposition P that says that John is at home. So the basic idea behind proving statement like these via contradiction involves finding some evidence that proves that John is at home. Let's assume that I find the evidence that John's door is not locked. And based on this evidence, I'm able to make a statement like this. If John was not at home, his door would be locked. And in our case, the door being locked is a contradiction to the fact that John is at home. Because every time John leaves, he locks the door. So by looking at the fact that the door isn't locked, I can successfully infer that John has not left. And the main takeaway here is that this Q could be anything. We may be able to find other contradictions which also prove that John is at home. Let's assume this contradiction that says that John was heard speaking from the balcony. And this also allows me to similarly argue if John wasn't at home, he wouldn't be heard speaking from his balcony. Therefore, both of these facts of the door being unlocked or John being heard speaking from his balcony is enough to prove that he is at home. Alright, now that we have some idea about this example, let's try to formalize this for any given proposition A. So the statement A is the statement that I want to prove, like John is at home, to be able to make two steps. So this is one and this is the second step. So let's begin with this one. This suggests that I need to find an implication such that if John wasn't at home, his door would be locked. Or if John wasn't at home, he wouldn't be heard speaking from his balcony. So I want to write an implication of the form not A implies B. John is not at home implies his door would be locked. And once we have established this implication, we look like we need an evidence. And this evidence needs to contradict with the then part of my if statement. So in my case, my if statement suggests that his door would be locked and therefore I want an evidence to suggest that his door isn't locked. So if I look on this side, I have my original proposition A that I need to prove. And in the first step, I'm able to find a contradiction B that is guaranteed to happen when A is not true. And therefore my evidence here looks like not B because it is a negation of this then part. And if I am able to guarantee that both of these are true, then I have proven my original statement A by contradiction. And before we move on to problems, let's quickly verify this analytically. If you have the rules 1 and 2, can you use the rules of inference like we did in our last video in order to reach A? So let's try that. We'll use the contrapositive of the first statement in order to give not B implies A. So this is the contrapositive of this statement as we've been aware for a long time now and we know that this contrapositive is equivalent to this original statement. So I can derive not B implies A and if I were to follow that up with a modus ponens on 2 and 3, I get a statement A because this looks like P implies Q and then I have a P. Therefore I can infer Q. So recalling on the core idea behind contradictions, let's say you want to prove this statement A. You start by saying if not A, something must happen and then you also prove that that something is false. So with these ideas in mind, we'll dive into a few problems next. If 3n plus 2 is odd, prove that n is odd. So we want to prove this statement by contradiction. But before that, I want to recall something from our last video. We discussed that the process of contradiction is used to prove a statement P and not the implication P implies Q. But the question that I have is in the form of the implication P implies Q. But it is important to understand that despite this being an implication, we can treat it as a single proposition P. So the difference lies in the fact that in the previous proof methods we used to dissect this implication. In the direct method we started with P and then we reached Q in order to prove our conclusion. In the indirect proof using contrapositive, we started reasoning with not Q and reached not P and that would also complete the proof. But in case of a proof by contradiction, we are just calling this whole thing a proposition P and then we are assuming not P and then proving some contradiction Q happens. So in that sense, I want you to understand that even though we are using contradiction, it is a general technique to prove any proposition P and not just the implication P implies Q. So let us proceed with our approach of contradiction without worrying about the fact that P is an implication. So my proof begins by assuming this whole thing is false. And at this point we understand clearly that an implication can only be false if the premise is true but the conclusion is false. 
therefore anytime you want to call the implication p implies q false you want to assume p is true and then q is false therefore we start by assuming that 3n plus 2 is odd but n is even and before continuing let me demonstrate another reason why this is true we know that the implication p implies q is equivalent to not p or q we discussed this in our discussion of implications and so since p implies q is not p or q if i need to complement this complement of this expression will be given by the de morgan's law and that will be equal to p and not q this negative changes into a positive the or changes into an and and then q gets negated and therefore this is another evidence that every time i need to say that p implies q is false i want to assume p and not q that is what i'm doing here i'm saying p implies q is false i'm doing that by saying p and not q so our next step is to show that this statement leads to a contradiction and the way I can prove this contradiction is by showing that 3n plus 2 being odd and n being even cannot happen at the same time. So we can argue if n is even then n is equals to 2k any even number can be replaced with 2k but let us see what it does to 3n plus 2. 3n plus 2 will become 3 times 2k plus 2 and it's easy to see why this is an even number and by demonstrating this fact we have successfully shown that there is no way this could be true. So since this result contradicts with the assumption that 3n plus 2 is odd, we have reached our contradiction and the proof is complete. Okay, we'll move on to the next topic discussing a couple of other proof methods. And the one that I want to touch is called exhaustive proofs. So exhaustive proof is a technique in proof which proves a given statement by proving it exhaustively for all members in the domain. So let us assume that I want to prove any mathematical fact for natural numbers less than 10. I am not worried about what thing I am proving here, that is not the point. But whatever it is I'm trying to prove, I know that I only need to prove it for 1, 2, 3 and then up to 9. Even if I don't know how to construct the proof analytically or by using reasoning, I really don't have to. All I need to do is to test the hypothesis for the given numbers 1 through 9 and assuming it works for all of them, I've proven the theorem. So oftentimes we're dealing with these finite domains which can be covered exhaustively. So let us demonstrate using a proof example. I need to prove that n plus 1 to the power 3 is greater than or equal to 3 to the power n. In this question, I may not have enough ideas or tools to expand this and show this analytically. But in this case, we see that the proof by exhaustion is much simpler because my domain only contains numbers less than 4. So we can just begin this by listing all of the possible cases. So we can list n is equals to 0, n is equals to 1, n is equals to 2, and then n is equals to 3. So these are all the four possibilities that are possible. By the way, the question says this is an integer. And because of that, we do not have any negative numbers or fractions here. But that point apart, all we need to do in this proof is to prove it for each of these cases. I can do this by simply substituting values. So whenever n is equals to 0, I have 1 cube is greater than 3 to the power 0 and 1 is greater than or equal to 1, which is true because 1 is equal to 1. I can similarly check for n is equals to 1, which will give me 2 cube, that is 8. And on the right hand side, I get 3 to the power 1, which is just equal to 3. And this is also true. And I invite you guys to evaluate for the other two possibilities and fill the values here. And you should be able to verify at the end that for all of the four cases, the values are true. So a really basic proof technique. I again want to focus on the fact that the problem is not important here, but the fact that we exhaustively considered all members in the domain to prove the fact. That is what defines an exhaustive proof. Next, we dive into the last proof method of our discussion. We're going to look at proof by cases. So the proof by cases works similarly to the proof by exhaustion, but it does not consider all of the members exhaustively. So instead of dealing with each member separately, it deals with a set of cases. So we can define it as a proof technique, which proves a quantified proposition by considering symmetric cases, where the proof of each case applies generally to the members within that case. So what do we mean by that? Let's try to compare it with our previous example and see. So let's say I need to prove some fact for integers from minus 4 to plus 4. And assume that I can observe from the problem that its behavior is the same for all negative numbers and the same for all positive numbers. So if I needed to prove this exhaustively, I would need to start from minus 4, minus 3 and then reach all the way to plus 4, 0 in between. But if the nature of the problem is such that one proof applies for all negative numbers and one proof applies for all the positive numbers, I do not need to go through this exhaustively. I can just build two cases, one case for negative numbers and one case for positive numbers. And then I'll generate two sub proofs. One proof will apply for all the negative numbers and one proof will apply for all the positive numbers. And the proof by cases is arguably more powerful than the proof by exhaustion. Because in order to exhaust the domain, I need to be able to go through each member of the domain and validate the fact. But when I'm constructing cases, each case may contain an infinite number of elements and still the proof might hold. 
so let us see how this concept is useful with an example i want to put a question here prove that the modulus of the product x y is equal to the product of their individual modulus mod x mod y so we should be able to see this easily because i'm just multiplying two numbers here and whatever the sign is this modulus will make sure that the result is positive when i look into this side i'm taking the modulus first but that doesn't affect the product i'm still gonna get a positive product that is the product of x and y but how do i prove that this is always correct if you know the definition of the mod function you know that mod y is equals to negative y if y is less than zero because the modulus should always be positive so if it is a negative number we just multiply it to the minus one to make it positive and then if it is already positive or greater than zero it's just gonna be y so it's just like saying if i have three the modulus is just three but if i have minus three i need to take the minus of this minus and then make it three and that gives me the idea of four cases here x could be positive or negative and at the same time y could be positive and negative so i want to split this problem by dividing it into four cases so let me do the first case here we'll assume that x is greater than zero and y is greater than zero the second case will be x is greater than zero and y is less than zero and i'll leave you guys to do the other two cases the other case will be x less than zero and y greater than zero and the final case will be both of them are less than zero so let me show you the general pattern and what to do in these type of problems and in hindsight i should have been a little bit careful this is going to be greater than zero greater than zero and the same thing here so for any variable i'm going to have a case for greater than or equal to zero and i'm going to have a case for less than zero and the reason i choose these specific cases comes from my definition i want a case for greater than or equal to zero and then i want a case for less than zero okay so coming back to the problem if i know x is greater than or equal to zero i know that mod x is simply x and similarly mod y is also simply y therefore the lhs of my expression becomes mod xy and because x and y are both positive this is just going to be equal to xy and on the same case if i were to look at the right hand side i can simply replace this mod x with a x and mod y with a y and then i get a xy also so in this case it holds so let me do this for one more case x greater than or equal to zero and y less than zero so my modulus definition for x does not change it is still x because it's greater than or equal to zero but mod y is now minus y now the lhs uses the exact same argument and in this case the positive product will be given by x times minus y which is just equal to minus xy and if i were to look at the rhs of mod x mod y so we can see that mod x is just x and mod y is minus y in this case so i have x times minus y and this gives me the same thing minus xy so the third case of x less than zero and y greater than or equal to zero will look exactly the same you'll get the result minus xy in that case as well and for the last case where both are negative you're just going to get the same product xy for lhs and rhs so i think it should be quite easy to consider the two other cases and complete them so i'll just move into the last topic of the video and this is called mistakes in proof okay we'll just be analyzing this topic from a theoretical perspective a mistake in proof is an error made on one or more steps in the proof that lead us to the wrong result during mathematical proofs this often arises as errors in arithmetic and basic algebra or it could be using an incorrect reasoning or inference on a logical step so in logic we have a philosophy something false cannot follow from something true therefore if i start with a statement that is a tautology and keep applying the rules of inference to it it should be impossible for me to get a result that is incorrect therefore if i start with a tautology and reach a contradiction that cannot happen and i have made a mistake somewhere in my proof so let me demonstrate this famous example of an invalid proof which tries to prove that 2 is equal to 1 we know that this is ridiculous and should not be possible so our job will be able to see the proof and see if we can spot the mistake in that proof so i want to start by writing my first statement a is equal to b and nothing really fancy here i'm just taking two numbers a and b and assuming that they are equal the next thing that i'll do is to multiply both sides of this equation with an a so that will give me an a square is equal to a b and i'm allowed to do this simply multiplying by a for the next step i want to subtract a b square from both sides so i want to write a square minus b squared is equals to a b minus b squared so i'm not going to write the reason here but i'm subtracting a b square from both sides which i'm also allowed to do now in the next step i'll just factorize this i'll be able to write a plus b times a minus b and this is equal to if i factor out the b i have b times a minus b so in the next step i simply want to cancel out the factor of a minus b and that will lead me to a plus b is equal to b and now i'm almost done i can see in my original statement that a is equal to b therefore i can substitute it here and i'll write b plus b is equal to b and i hope you see where i'm going now the next step will be 2b equals to b and then the ninth in parentheses step will give me 2 is equals to 1 so you can see that in this proof i did exactly what i was not supposed to do i started with a tautology i applied valid rules of inferences but i got into a wrong conclusion how was this possible 
Based on our discussion, I must have made some mistake in our proof here because a contradiction cannot follow from a tautology. You could pause the video and think about it if you want, but spoilers coming out. The error is in the cancelling of a minus b. Since this statement says that a is equal to b, a minus b is actually 0. And what I'm doing here is cancelling the 0, which I'm not allowed to do. See, this statement is correct. It is true to say that 2 into 0 is equal to 1 into 0. Okay, so this is right. But I am not allowed to cancel the 0 from this fact and conclude that 2 is equal to 1. This is the point where I went wrong. And I can see that the mistake in proof was caused because of this statement where I made a wrong inference. Because this inference step of cancelling the factor a minus b is not allowed. Alright, so that concludes the discussion for this video and the chapter. In fact, our next chapter is also entirely dependent on proof methods. We'll be looking into induction and recursion from the next video. So I'll see you guys then. Until then, have a good day and bye.